Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 234 for Monday, November 18th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab. Uh, the show by, for, and about working musicians here back in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here back in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. You and I do a fantastic job of coordinating our travel, it seems. The stars will do line up sometimes. They, uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, How was your trip? I, my trip was fantastic. We were in Nashville for the three and a half days, I guess. Um, the primary driver of the trip was visiting uh, schools with my son who's applying to colleges and all that good stuff. But, um, but I was, I was excited to go to Nashville. I have never, I'd never been. Um, and I hadn't, I really had no idea. I knew of course that it's, it, you know, there's a lot of music there that was, you know, not a surprise. What was a surprise was we got there um, and it's an easy flight from here. It's like less than three hours in either direction. And so we got there early afternoon, checked into our hotel. The hotel had a shuttle bus that took us to downtown. We were over by Vanderbilt, which is kind of about a mile away from downtown and um, in the West End. And so we took it to downtown. I had no idea that there was Broadway there that, that uh-huh. had all these clubs. Austin, Texas, where I lived, and I love that town, calls itself the live music capital of the world. Um... I'm not so sure that they really should keep saying that after visiting Nashville. Uh, I'm interested. How, I've not been to Austin, believe it or not, in my really? entire life, all my life working with Apple. I've not been to Austin. And because um, there's so much Apple in, in Austin. Yeah, for sure. And I've heard I've and I've built it up in my mind about what it's like there. And I actually have a good friend, a drummer who just moved there huh. back there. Yeah. And he's he's gigging. But he says, you know, gigging is, is pretty low paying. And um, I, I'm interested how Nashville and Austin compare to each other. Cause I, I went to Nashville with my daughter last year just for a fun long weekend. And, yeah. you know, I really enjoyed it, but it was, a uh, you kind of, it's not hard to kind of peek behind the curtain if you know what you're looking for. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And yeah, yeah as a, you can see that sort of anywhere. So comparing Nashville to Austin, I, I saw a lot of similarities between the two towns and I don't know how the people in Nashville feel about those similarities or people making those comparisons or the people in Austin feel about that. But, uh, but definitely very, very similar towns. Nashville kind of reminds me of where Austin was when we wound up moving there, which was back in 95. So, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, where it's, you know, manageable. The people there complain about the traffic, but they don't actually have traffic maybe yet. Austin now actually has real traffic. But um, but um, the music really surprised me because in Austin, I think the stretch of 6th Street, which is in Austin where sort of the concentration of music clubs are, might be a longer stretch. There might be more clubs there. Wow. but. Um, but in, but Nashville's Broadway strip there, the, the section of that where there's clubs, the clubs are way bigger and in general, I mean, there's some small ones too, but the big ones are way bigger than anything you'll see in Austin. Well, and- just to set that up, the, you know, that, that stretch of Broadway is interesting. That's basically the tourist strip of bars and like, you know, yes. cowboy hat stores and that type of thing. And it's interesting. And again, not having not been to Austin, Imagine 50 to 75 bars on each side of the street, you know, for about six blocks, I'd say. And um, big neon signs, many of them are in some way affiliated with a current popular country or, or That's crossover right. artist, right? That's so right. it's, it's yep. you know, Blake Shelton's this, or you know, I think there's a Kid Rock. Yeah, he just bar, opened so. one. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and so big, big neon signs um, inviting you in. And they're, they're all kind of hard rock cafe ish right they're um, they're nicer there's kind oh, of a formula to them they're the, you know they're not divey they're definitely you know well some nice, of them are divey. They are big some of them are divey the ones that are affiliated with you know some name brand artist are not divey. that's fair yeah. yeah 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 but 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 there are divey ones but it it like 
At three in the afternoon on a Thursday, we just went downtown. We wanted to get some nachos and, you know, a drink or whatever, you know, to tide us over till dinner and or tie us over till dinner. I don't know why I said tide. Um, maybe I was thinking <laughs> of eating Tide Pods. Don't do that, kids. Um, and <laughs> we had to go into four different places before we could find one that had an open table. Yeah. At three in the afternoon on a Thursday. And I thought at first, well, you know, the Country Music Awards were the night before. So maybe this is abnormal. And as we asked around, no, in fact, it's not abnormal. Basically, from 11 a.m. till about 3 a.m., these places are all just packed. Austin has as many, if not more clubs, more of them divey than not. But the divey clubs don't take that the wrong way. I love the divey clubs. Uh, and we wound up in one and had some nachos and listened to some guys saying that we're freaking amazing. Uh, yep. yep. But, um, but the, they are not packed during the day, during the week, they are packed Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. And, and that's it. Whereas these clubs in Nashville are packed all day, every day. And, and I think part of that is that Nashville is not in Austin is in Texas. And once you like, Texas is its own entity. It is not part of the South. It's not part of the West. It is Texas, right? Whereas Nashville is is part of the South, but also not all that far away. Like I said, it took us less than three hours to fly there. And thinking about all of the places that are very, very close to Nashville. I mean, it. lots of people drive there for a long weekend or whatever, but it's just as easy to fly. So I think right. it's proximity to so many people is part of what makes it uh, a more popular tourist destination. I would not call Austin a tourist destination. It's it's a great place to go if you know what to do there, but it is not a tourist destination like Nashville is. Uh, not, it's not, not even mu- music, t- music, music tourism? Uh, you, you know, you have to kind of know what you're doing to be in Austin as a music tourist, I would think. Whereas in Nashville... Uh, you know, we just stumbled into it. I, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish we had thought ahead. We've had a lot going on in our lives and this trip was sort of a, a fast one. So we didn't plan ahead and say, look, book a table at the Bluebird or, the, you know, some of those other things that, that we could have done if we thought about it right. in advance. But right, right. we didn't have any trouble entertaining ourselves, eating well. Uh, you know, there was lots to do as a as a tourist there. And, and I feel like Austin isn't quite. It's just not geared towards tourism. Not that again, not that you couldn't have a good time there, but but it's not it's not a tourist town in that sense. Got it. Yeah. But I like I loved Nashville. I will definitely go back regardless of whether my son winds up, you know, getting in or going to a school there. So No, I I loved it as well. The food was great. Um the vibrancy of the scene was great. And you know, music starting ten, eleven in the morning and going until two, three in the morning is an amazing thing. And I, it was funny because when I say peeking behind the curtain, um, there's just a lot of talent. I don't think I don't think you can even crack the door open if you don't have a lot of talent. Right. Um, and um, but it then it gets weird when you see that much talent. Really understanding what it's like to try and find a star in the making. Right. I mean, there's everybody's a seven and a half or an eight. Yes. And and when you're when you're deluged with seven and a halfs or eights you know, finding nines and tens is a little numbing. It's a little hard. And it's funny because, you know, some of the places they were playing the same old classic rock covers that every place else in the country plays, even in these big bars, because it was making people happy. Right. Yep. And, uh, and it was filling the tip jar. And um, I guess I, I don't know this. Maybe you do. I don't think a lot of those bar gigs are paid gigs. I think a lot of them are, are uh, tip tip only gigs. Based on some friends that I have in Nashville and people that have lived there and left because they're full time musicians. Uh, yeah, no, Nashville gigs don't pay well at all. In fact, I, I think they pay arguably some of the worst in the country. Even some of the top name brand acts out there. Uh, don't pay their side musicians all that well. It might be, you know, a hundred bucks a gig kind of thing to play Amazing. for 10,000 people. It's like, well, you know, you can, you're going to pay, play for a hundred bucks tonight. So do you want to do it in a bar for, you know, 150 people or do you want to do it for 10,000, you know, whichever, but yeah, no, these people are, are super talented. There was, there was, um, in the one sort of divey place that we went into. I, and I also noticed the sound equipment in every one of these places really good, was really good. Like, 
I saw nothing that was more than five years old. And in Austin, that is definitely not the case. <laughs> uh, not even close. Not that it sounds bad, but, you know, all of this stuff was was new, active stuff, uh, you, you know, all digital. I was like, oh, this is this is different. But we saw this one guy and he was just playing, uh, you know, old country tunes. It was this guy, middle aged guy, maybe on an acoustic guitar. Great voice, like super talented. And somebody came up and asked him to play Bob Seger's Turn the Page. And without batting an eye, and the guy, of course, threw something in the tip jar. I wasn't close enough to see what it was. And uh, and without batting an eye and certainly without, you know, pulling out any sheet music or an iPad or anything, the guy on stage shifted. He Basically, he never stopped strumming his guitar at all. Like every song just would sort of blend into the next one. And so huh. he, he, he went right into Turn the Page and killed it. I mean, played it like he wrote it. And uh, and then after that, just right back to the, you know, country stuff. And then some other guys sort of joined him on stage. There were no breaks, which I thought was interesting. Everything just kept rolling. And these other guys came up on stage and joined him. And then he left uh, and they played. They shifted more into a rock mode. They played a couple of Beatles tunes and, you know, some things like that. Um, but uh, everybody was really good. Yeah, everybody's really good. I, I remember we were there for three days and I saw. One guy who was in three different groups that was playing, and yeah. um, and um, it he, the interesting thing is they're I don't want to say jaded. Um, let's use weathered, right? You know, yeah, that's they a get a lot term. of tourists coming up and saying, "Hey, great, great!" Stuff. And some of them are better than others at embracing that type of thing. I, I gotta imagine that that life is a, is a tremendous grind, even though you're playing music. Playing music that many hours, you know, for for tips primarily, and you know, where are you going when everybody next to you is a seven and a half or eight? Like, you know, I I exist in my area, you know, through pretty hard work, but you know, by no means am I a seven and a half or an eight, right? I mean, there there are people who play better, sing better. You know, I can work harder and and succeed. I don't know that you can do that in Nashville. Well, that was, I mean, we had Buddy Gibbons, the drummer, on uh, on the show. Uh, earlier this year, maybe late last year. And he left Nashville for LA some 15 years ago or something and talked about that in the episode because he wanted to make a living and, yeah. and couldn't. But he also said one of the reasons he chose LA was a, he felt like he might be able to, you know, create a better career for himself there, which he has. But why done. is that? I mean, I mean, is it country music and kind of a Midwest mentality that, that keeps, that keeps side wages down until until you make it as a star. I mean, why would L.A. be any different? I mean, there's certainly as much competition in L.A. Well, I mean, like Buddy was able to craft his own career in, you know, creating uh, theme music for commercials and jingles and bumpers and all of that stuff. So with the TV industry and the movie industry being right there that as well as the music industry, yeah. he crafted that. But he also said part of the reason he went out there is – Exactly what you're saying. There's a lot of sevens and eights out there, but in order to see the tens, you got to go to LA. That's where yeah. the, the, you know, the tens all hang out, yeah. um, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I liked it. Like as a, as a place to go visit Nashville, it's super easy to get around the airports, right? I mean, yeah. it's 10 minutes from downtown. It like city's clean. Yeah. Restaurants are good. It's reasonably priced in general. Super and, cheap. I know. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I, I will it's definitely. It's a good go experience back. for musicians. And again, yeah, if yeah. you if you don't if you if you don't put yourself in the analyze everything mode and just let it wash over you, yes. there's a lot of really good music to enjoy. Yeah, you just gotta kind of yeah, you you need to to move into consumer mode. Uh, you know, a friend of mine I'd posted on Facebook saying, Hey, any advice? Because we like I said, we really didn't have any mental energy to plan a whole lot. And one of my friends who's a full time musician, he actually lives in Australia now, but he said, oh, you know, I can I know some I have some colleagues and friends in Nashville. I can introduce you if you want to do some networking. And I was like, yeah, no, 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 not not this trip, not thinking about <laughs> moving there. Like, no, but but cool. Like, but no, I'm going to intentionally shut off for the weekend and just be a consumer and, and be OK yeah. with that. Yeah, that's cool. So we have. Um, well, we have a good topic to address about vanity songs that we will get to. Uh, I mentioned iPads on stage uh, and, the, and the fact that this guy didn't have one. And, and that reminded me of something you posted uh, on Facebook for us. And so I, I want to have time. Uh, one more time again. Um, 
But I want to first share this great review that we got uh, on Apple Podcasts. And you can leave us a review if you go to giggabpodcast.com slash reviews. That will link you as close as we can get you to Apple Podcasts. And we love these reviews, not only because we like them, but also they actually do really help sort of have the show chart. And then that brings us more listeners. And that's good for everybody. Um, this one is from BP Lath from the U.S., who says, I've been listening to the show for many, many years and always look forward to the conversation each week. It's insightful getting to hear other weekend warriors share their experiences playing music. A, B, P, exclamation point. Well, A, B, P to you too, B, P, laugh. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So iPads on stage, Paul. You posted so, a thing. The funny thing is, it's right, become. We're, we're going to limit like this to, yeah, to yeah, no please. more than five minutes. I, I no. will cut us off when we get to the five minute mark. But go, let's go. Every every resource on on Facebook on the internet that that has a conversation with musicians in general, certainly cover band musicians in particular, has covered this to death. It has become this hostile thing, and you see these threads emerging, and people get heated about it. Yet it is still being still being discussed. And I came across a little six minute audio podcast that this guy did about it. And I thought it made some good final points. So in the interest of, of uh, beating something to death even more, I thought I'd, I thought I'd offer, you know, some thoughts about this. Okay. Cool? Yeah. 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 I have, I have some thoughts to share too. So I, I will keep you short enough that we can fit our five minutes there, but yeah. Yep. yep go. The basic premise is this. Um, he's basically calling everybody out who, who justifies and rationalizes it because the justifications and rationalizations in this podcaster's opinion just don't hold up. A, uh, how many major artists use a teleprompter? And he blows that out of the water and says, it's, it's not a teleprompter. And those people know how to use a teleprompter and they d- it doesn't take away from their performance. So that, I think that that's a pretty good thing. B, how would you feel if you went to a play and the actors were walking around with a, with a, with an iPad to remember the words, would you feel as though they didn't prepare for their, for their craft? Makes sense to me. I think that that's accurate as well. And then he cites an example where a friend of his totally unsolicited had called him recently and said, Hey, I saw an interesting artist at a local club, but man, they used an iPod pad on stage and it just looks so amateurish because they kept looking down and not making eye contact with the audience. And, you know, it was just kind of weird. It was clearly that, you know, he was engaged with his iPad as much as he was with the audience. Yeah. And I was thinking about this. The reason I, the reason I shared it is a, is cause you can never beat something too much, but, or maybe you can, but B, <laughs> we'll I think the thing is this. I think every time I read the rationalizations of it, and I will say again, I use an iPad in my acoustic things, my kind of pickup bandy thing. And I feel a little bit like a fraud in doing it. I do take, requests and that's part of it but that's not that's not all of it that's not I should all be of it more sure prepared. Yeah. i should be more prepared and i think that's the thing is the the justifications really truly for using it they tend to be rationalizations. well there's just rationalizations and- i i will say this though i recently i, I recently saw little feet and it was before paul barrere passed away but after he had stopped playing with them and larry campbell filled his shoes for the night he I, to my knowledge, he didn't have an iPad on stage where I was sitting. All I could see was his music stand and I couldn't really see what was on it, but I think it was just paper. It was pretty low down and, and it was obviously there because it impeded my view of the drummer just based on where we were sitting. So I kind of had to jockey for position around it if I wanted to see Gabe Ford, but he was a master with this. Like he engaged the crowd and occasionally while he was singing, like you'd see him between lines, just like glance down for what is the next line or what's the chord structure. But then it was right back to the crowd. And that's the way a pro deals with it. That's the way a pro deals with a teleprompter, which of course is highlighting the one phrase or passage that you would need next, which makes it a lot easier to use. But he was a pro with it. If I didn't know that his music stand was there, I never would have known that he was cheating. Uh, you, There's you know. almost no way for you to raise your finger up to your iPad to flick up to another page of lyrics if right. you're not using a foot pedal and have it look like a uh, uh, an engaged thing. Again, lead singers, it's particularly heinous. Oh, yeah. Sidemen, you can you might be able to get away with it. We're all, you know, again, hard and fast rules. Who cares? I'm only pointing out that 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 anyone who defends it, it's a rationalization in my point. 
and oh, you yeah. can rationalize. Well, it's a crush, you can be right? ticked off at me. It yeah. is what you know. What's right and wrong in the matter is is more black and white. I think. And again, if you have a guy subbing and he has twenty four hours notice to learn a show, and he needs something. I saw I saw Counting Crows a couple years ago, and they had a sub bass player for one show, and he was standing back by the drum riser, and he had a book a binder open on the drum riser. It was about knee high, maybe a little bit higher than knee high. And he would glance down at it as, as I was watching it actually pretty careful as seldomly as he could. Yeah. And really just kind of spark a memory. And, you know, he was playing with his ears um, as much as anything. Well, that's so, the thing is by having a crutch there, it's it, it. Yes, there's the crowd, but also there is the, um, the fact that you're less engaged with the other musicians around you too. But I will say, I, I, I will, I will wrap this by, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's right or wrong. Uh, and, and I don't think it's as black and white as, as you said, my feeling is you got to know what you're getting yourself into with one of these things. And if you are not self-aware enough to make that evaluation, have someone else make it for you and, and listen to them. Yeah, uh, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, there's our there's our five minutes. So done. <laughs> let's talk about vanity songs, Mr. Kent. <laughs> so I I uh, I put this on our list again. Our synchronicity is is perfection. I put this on our list because it's our most recent fling gig. I aired. We had a three set night at a uh, at an American Legion club. So you know, three set night over four hours. Yeah. 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 Three set night over four hours. That's right. And it was an American Legion club, which is, you know, a, a, I'll call it a working man's drinking club kind of thing. It's, it's that sort of meat and potatoes vibe. Right. Uh, and, uh, and obviously veterans there um, is the core of, of those types of clubs. And I thought, okay, well, it, you know, I, we can get away with some level of vanity songs as you can at every gig. You don't necessarily have to, but you can, and I know that, you know, there's, there's, especially in, in fling, there's a few guys that they have their favorites that wouldn't make it to a set list of hits. So as I was building the set list, I had what turns out to be the wrong mindset. You know, I've all often said that even if I don't follow the set list, I still find the process of building it. Even if I spend an hour on it, uh, I find the process really valuable because it keeps all these different ideas in my head to think about during the gig. But my problem was I went into this set list building of like, okay, how can we fit vanity songs in amongst the meat and potatoes, you know, hits that are going to, that are definitely going to kill, you know? And I realized after the first set that we needed to make a change because our vanity songs, even though we only played a few of them, were not landing at all and they were distracting from what would otherwise have been a good show. Huh. Um, and, and so as I walked up on stage for the second set, you know, trying to, to reset my head on all of this, I said to the guys, I'm like, look, here's the thing. If it's clever, it's out. There's nothing <laughs> clever about the next two sets of this show. We are playing you know, to entertain. And, and that really like, that's the thing about it all is I don't care what song I'm playing. I care about two things. A, are we playing what the crowd expects? Right. And we've had that conversation and B, are we playing it well? Right. That's the, those are the, to me, those are the only two things that matter. And if it's an all original night, man, sweet home Alabama would feel just as awkward to me as playing some, you know, obscure jam band tune in the middle of what should be classic rock night. It, you know, like it, it, it's all about, you know, what's the setting? What are people expecting? And 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 whatever you choose to play, can you play it well? Like mm. that, that's the, to me, those are the, the two important things. And we to be perfectly honest, I, we played a fine show. But we failed at both of those things at times because some of these vanity songs are sort of outside of our fling wheelhouse in terms of what we're good at doing. And uh, and, you know, I even as audibles, I found myself like what would come to mind is like some song that is, you know, moderately a vanity tune to make that guy happy. And it's like, no, 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 no. Just got to like worry, think about the crowd. Go, 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 go. And it was really interesting kind of, you know, thinking watching this happen 
in real time and then also thinking about it afterwards, like, yeah, that prep time I put into building the set list really impacts how I can react in the moment, huh. too. Yeah, it was just one of those things, you know, and the gig was fine, but, you know, it wasn't as great as it could have been. So the cool part is, I think you have a counter to this. Well, you, yeah, so the, I'm on the other side. So yeah. the house rockers aren't playing terribly much right now, but once every two weeks or something. Yeah. And so the show we did two weeks ago, which and we hadn't played for two weeks before that. Um, I was like, you know, let's and it's a club that we're well known in. We get a good crowd, Homer crowd. Let's just take it easy on ourselves and just play the hits, you know. Yeah. And so yeah. I I crafted a set list that had good energy right from the beginning. And again, sometimes the temptation is to build it up a little bit in the beginning. But, you know, the room was pretty full when we started and there was a good buzz. So we just went for it. But it was all the kind of no brainer stuff. And we have. I'd say in a three hour show, we play about thirty five you know, okay. we, we, two sets, about 17 songs in, in an hour and 20 or something like that. Right. Sure. And, um, and, uh, I put this together and, and it was like, let, let's just play the stuff that works. And it was a couple things. One, again, we're not playing very much. So, you know, I don't know where the whole band's focus is, you know, a downbeat and what they remember, what they don't remember, what subtle nuances and all those types of things. And in my mind, I was like, probably not a good night to kind of test that and maybe lose the crowd for a song by going out and doing a song that makes the band happy, but doesn't necessarily make the, the audience happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, which is, which is what I would call a vanity song, right? Like, yeah. The, yeah. 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 Uh, it, yeah. I love I'm, that. I'm finding, often, yeah. I'm finding often for us, the tower of power music is kind of vanity because it's really hard to dance to. I mean, it's cool. And the horn lines are amazing and yep. they're really fun to play. And when the band grooves, it's fun, but in general, they're not, you know, pop dance grooves and there are interesting things to try and play. So that aside, so, you know, we played all our tower power, excuse me, we played all our earth, wind fire stuff. We played all our Bruno Mars stuff. We played our very, you know, most obvious classic rock jet airliner, that type of stuff. It was a great show. And, um, the vibe of the show is the thing that sticks with me. Like the audience was happy from the downbeat on the band got off on the, on the energy from the audience, from the downbeat on. And the show just kind of had this nice wave. And so, you know, again, two weeks go by and we played on Saturday night. I was like, I'm not going to mess with that. Let's go for it again. I put in one that is a fringe song. I put in Rosalita. Yeah. Yeah. Springsteen is, I mean, some of his stuff is danceable. That is not one of them. Right, but that's more of a prog rock tune I, in, in a sense. <laughs> well, well, in, in terms form. of the form and stuff. Yeah. 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 So, so I, you know, I overthought myself and I was like, oh, I have afforded this. We haven't played it in a while. I want to see if we can play it a little more going forward. So I'll throw it in two thirds of the way through the first set. And A, we had some technical problems that, that got in the way, but it was like cold water, like, dude, just keep it simple and you will be successful. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is, you know, I've said this many times, the the act of playing in a cover band, getting back in a cover band, picking your guitar up again, being a leader of a cover band is an exercise in wanting to express how great your taste is or how right you are. Like you haven't seen my fastball, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah, no, like, I, I, you I'm say that a pull lot. Out this I, song. I was thinking of, of you saying those words when I was approaching the stage and, and subsequently told the band if it's clever it's out you know but it was it was you know your words of oh you haven't seen my <laughs> fastball yet you know what they don't care about your fastball so yeah. like let's not throw it yeah that's right or or likely those songs not enough of them will care about your fastball i mean the thing is it might put on a light and the the rationalization we're talking about rationalizations yeah the rationalization yeah. is five people go oh that was so cool i haven't heard that in so long and you think you've proven yourself right while the other you know, 165 people in the room are like, what was that? You know, yeah, well, who you cares? didn't prove yourself right. right. Exactly. So, yeah. and then, you know, as my good friend, Joe Rizzi, it's his birthday today and I love ah, him. Happy birthday, Joe. Happy birthday, Joe. Uh, as he always says, there's so many hit songs to choose from. There's so many through the years that are top 40 songs uh, that will work that, you know, the, the you really don't get bonus points for being clever. Yeah, you know what? At least, at least in the dance cover band genre, you know, like you're well, not you're, you're not strictly that. You, so, you, so you have afforded yourself and built a brand and built a show around 
you are part of your experience of coming to see fling is you are guaranteed a surprise every now and then. Now, how you use that is up to you, whether you're Correct. using that power for good or for evil, that's up to you. Well, but, and, uh, and really, in my opinion, we should just be using it for originals. Like there's that we have such good originals. They go over well when placed appropriately. You know, I mean, we, we got to put the crowd on our side first and all of that stuff. And then it's like, Oh, Hey, here's a fling original. And as long as we play one of our good ones and, I'll be, you know, not so humble here. The ones that we choose to play live are mostly fantastic songs and much Ooh. better than the, a you know, cut. the fastball. Uh, yeah. Like actually fastball has written some great songs, but <laughs> I, I mean the, 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 the metaphoric fastball, not the band fastball, but yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you know, those deep cuts are why play them. If no one's going to know the song anyway, Let's play a song we wrote that we know people actually react pretty well to because they know they're not going to know it. Right. There's no expectation that you're going to know some, you know, weird radiators cover of a Joan Armitrading <laughs> tune or something, you know, like that, like might as well just say this. We wrote this. You don't know it. And now actually people go in with a better mind to that. I, absolutely. And the thing is, you earn you earn their attention. Yes. By playing stuff that they love and you you own them then. And then you have you've greased the skids yeah. to deliver something important to you. And you're right. If you have original music, that is a great great way to set it up and sell it by earning, you know, an audience's interest by doing things that delight them. And, and then you, and then you have an opportunity to, to, to test something and they will afford you that. And in fact, we had one gig, uh, I think it was earlier this summer where, you know, it was, it was one of these like beach gigs or something where you really do need to go in knowing that you're playing mostly classic rock. Right. You know, and we had the crowd in the palm of our hands, so we started playing a couple of originals, and they liked them. And we got up on stage for whatever the next set was, and somebody came up and was like, hey, would you play that original again, this Ooh. set? And it was like, Pretty you know, we kind of have a rule that we don't repeat songs. But in this <laughs> case, like, yeah, yeah. of course. Hell yeah. Right. Hell yeah. Yeah, we will let you hear this song twice. Let's sink it into your heads. That's right. No problem. I, I think it's a, this is a thing. Let's call this episode Get Over Yourself, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, totally that's really it. what we're talking about here. And I get it because <laughs> I'm exactly that guy with all the Springsteen stuff that I try and will my way onto audiences because I love it so much. But, you know, if we're talking about success and, you know, you play music to make people happy. Yes, there is that magic area where you are so good at emoting that thing that it that it grabs people yes but but be real right you know i i would i would hasten the, the guess that most people listening to the show playing in a band know exactly what we're talking about when we call them vanity songs and if they worked all the time they wouldn't be called vanity songs right they would be you know <laughs> right. a-list stuff, right right you know just be real i mean you know if your goals are to delight your audience and work and get paid there's a path and a business process to that. If your goal is to make yourself happy, you are by definition uh, taking a harder path to success. And I'm certainly not going to say it's not possible, but if you, you know, want to demonstrate complexity, I'll give you a good example. My good friend, Nick, I love him. One of the best musicians I know. He's the keyboard player in the house rocker. You know him, you love him, right? Great guy. Great singer. Great player. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Nick, Nick is a player and he, uh, he thrives on a certain amount of complexity in arrangements, in, you know, in, in the music that he likes. I mean, he likes Grateful Dead and he likes funk and he likes quite a few things, but he has a brain that embraces complexity. He's out chasing um, a Frank Zappa tribute project right, right now. He's put it together. He told me he's all about this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's, his heart and soul is into it. And he, you know, he's networking with other Frank Zappa um, enthusiasts trying to get charts and trying to get arrangements and, you know, help his, help his band that he's assembled, learn parts. He is making the choice that he, and he knows that the path to this is that there's a subculture of people in the world who love Zappa, love what Zappa meant to the music world, love, love what Zappa meant to society. And, uh, you know, he is really enjoying kind of connecting with kind of a worldwide a fraternal order of Zappa fans. Uh, and he's going to be bringing this, this music. It's it's not going to be for everybody. I mean, if you like Nick, it's, it'll, you know, it'll, sure. it'll be fun to watch him perform something that he, that means so much to him, but um, you know, it's not earth, wind and fire. It's not Bruno Mars. It's not jet airliner. It's, it's going to be 
music for people who want to pay attention, right? That's yes. kind of what Zappa requires, right? But, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what it, I'm saying. Because the crowd that's going to come to that isn't going to be surprised that it's not the house rockers, right? Like yes. it's going to be billed as a Zappa night. So if you right. show up expecting Sweet Home Alabama, well, you know, the closest you might get is a Zappa inspired version of Whipping Post. And, you know, that's that's where it's going to go. You know, like, that's OK. But if you show up at Fred's house of dance and revelry and you expect him to dance all night. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work out as well as you thought you might. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, what, what what business are you in? Get over yourself. I mean, you know, or at least know exactly who you are and know exactly this is where the business and art thing kind of diverge, right? Yeah. You know, you do have a job to do by delivering. You said expectations. And I think you, I think there's you can be bigger than just giving people what they expect. I think you can they don't know always know what they expect. And it is fun to find those songs that were top 40 songs somewhere in the last 50 years that still put a smile on people's face. But see, to you me, that out- still that still hits, you know, the esteemed Joe Rizzi's advice, which is there are so many hit songs to choose. So from. many songs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that doesn't I mean, diverge from that. It's just you're that is the you know, that that's the fastball that that is accepted. But you got to You got to be right with it. You, you know, you can pick some hit from the 60s or even the 50s. Like, Build Me Up Buttercup. It's one of those tunes. I see college students going nuts for that Absolutely. song right now. And it's like, Jesse's how is girl. that even possible? <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those songs are timeless and they were hits because they're just solid, good songs. I mean, they, they, they you know, there's things that happen that are are time dependent, you know, styles of music production that are time dependent, but they're, you know, great songs that have either a cool message or a great beat or a happy feel to them. And they just work all the time. And I think we, we had an interesting conversation during break the other night about, um, we got asked to play the cool and the gang song celebration oh, for, yeah. a, for a wedding. Yeah. Right. And, um, one of our band members was like, are you freaking kidding me? And I said, you know what, dude, the statute of limitations is gone on that. And on on Freebird and on Stairway to Heaven, nobody plays Freebird anymore. Nobody's played Freebird for fifteen or twenty years now, right? Unless right. it's a tongue in cheek thing. So it's a uh, great well, freaking song if you do it right. Well, that's the thing is, it, I think I mentioned the last time I played Freebird live was the night they caught the Boston bomber, and that was an inspired ver- like the crowd requested it as they often do. Uh, <laughs> but we delivered it for eight minutes or something. And by the end of it, but the ev- guy who shouts it out because he's drunk and he thinks he's being clever and it, and it's a right. tongue in cheek gag. Don't, don't do that. The song, you know, meant too much to too many people Correct. For you to kind of make it schlocky and you're only making it worse. Right. Right. But I'd say with acoustic madness, we play um, stairway to heaven oh, yeah. and Mary Ellen sings the freaking hell out of it. And it, it's still an amazing. Somebody wrote that freaking song. You are stunned by how someone put together something so majestic. Yeah. Uh, and well, and the know, same is true with Bohemian Rhapsody. We played Stairway to Heaven and Bohemian Rhapsody at back to back madhouses um, this earlier this year, whatever it was, the spring or the summer. And I mean, they're hard songs to play, like really hard songs, and especially to sing them and all of that stuff. But if you can sure. nail it. Holy crap. Like, like if you do it, not Rock tongue in majesty. cheek, but yeah, it's freaking amazing. Yeah. People love it. So, yep. yep, yep, yep. That's how it works, man. That's how it works. Yeah. But you're right. You, But even to do that, you kind of have to get over yourself, right? It's not, it, it's, you're not playing, you're not thinking Wayne's world. At least I certainly wasn't thinking Wayne's world when I played, bohemian rhapsody it was like right. no i'm i'm playing the role of dave the drummer who's playing a song that's bigger than him and and we gotta hold this we gotta figure out a way to make this thing work like we gotta deliver this so that that crowd yeah. is on their feet by the end of it and we and we succeeded which was pretty freaking awesome but yep. um but yeah you gotta get over yourself you know i um what did what did uh somebody asked John Fishman, the drummer from Fish years ago, why he wears a dress on stage? And and really it started out as a joke, right? But it epitomizes what that band that band's approach and and he said, "Well, you know, we don't take ourselves seriously on stage. We take the music seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously." And it's like, what a good attitude to go in with. Uh, you know, this isn't it's about you as much as it 
it, uh, up until the point that you stop delivering the music with conviction, unless you're a comedy act. And then that's totally then then you deliver the comedy with conviction like that's fine. But if you're going to go and play these songs, you're entertaining it. You know, it's about how it comes across, not how you felt about it when you were a teenager. Right. I think. I don't know. Yeah. Get over yourself. Well, I, it's the right I, title get over for the yourself, show. But I mean, sometimes how you felt about a song when you were a teenager, I would just stretch that a little bit. That thing that a teenager has, you know, laying in bed with the lights off with the headphones on and a song changes their life. Yeah. That that's something good to draw. On. That's good to draw. On. No, I mean, the oh, I, I was I'm I'm inserting Dave, the teenager here, who is, <laughs> you, you know, completely against all classic rock or anything like that, because I was into prog rock. In fact, Got it. I wasn't even in. I was thinking earlier You're today. Snob. I I totally was. I I mean I sh I'm sure I still am a snob, but I was I was you know a self intended snob. Like I didn't even like prog rock because it wasn't jazz or fusion. So and I would just tell sixteen year old Dave, get over yourself. Get you know, oh absolutely <laughs> oh and then and then I was was asked to play a rush tune with these guys and I got into that and I was like oh holy crap and then I went you know deep down that rabbit hole and then it was I joined a band and they were like uh, we're, we're going to play some Cure and REM songs and it was like oh you have gigs right okay uh, I probably won't hate myself for this you know and I played and then of course got to find that not only did I like playing. REM and the cure. I actually like listening to REM and the cure. And that hap that's happened over and over again. Country music too. I, you know, I, I never liked country music until I got hired to play some. I was like, Oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 what? There's more going on here than I, than I gave it credit for. It's like, yeah, get over yourself. Yep. All right. That's all I got. What do you got? Anything else? That was fun. We didn't know if we had enough to fill this episode and <laughs> it's funny how, you know, just kind of, yeah. just kind of, expands to fit the space you give it huh it it does well we have strong feelings about a lot of things you know we you know it's maybe, not a problem <laughs> it's not a problem maybe maybe we need to learn to get over ourselves paul uh, <laughs> uh, oh wait there is something else we need to learn abp well, what did that guy mean don't get over always being performing that's sir. right see you next week feedback Thanks. at giggabpodcast.com 